Okay. Welcome to uh, the November edition of the RPDS Project Club. Today, Connor is going to walk us through uh, his Census Explorer Shiny app. Take it away, Connor. Okay, thanks for hosting and organizing, as ever, John. Um, let me pull up my Shiny apps thing and we'll get started. So, all right, is this showing up appropriately? Um, yes. Okay. So um, just a brief overview of the motivation. Um, so I've been interested in census data and statistics about neighborhoods and mapping for a long time. Um, that's one of the reasons I got into R was I like, I like to make maps with data. Um, so um, that was one of the primary motivations, which is to learn more about how that works um, and get a better understanding of how that works with Shiny specifically. Um, I learned a lot about, about Shiny in the book club. So if you are interested in learning more about Shiny, I highly recommend the book club if that gets uh, spun up again. Um, so um, if you've ever worked with census data, um, the census IDs are you know, 12 to 18, uh length strings of numbers you know it's not very informative it's not memorable um so you know it's not like it's a code you know you can sort of mem memorize those or county where there's a name um census tracts are just not it's just numbers right so if you want to understand more about them you should put them on a map so you can compare them side by side um so I wanted to figure out how to do that in Shiny with um, Leaflet and then do some interactive graphs with Plotly um, and also learn more about how to make a, a you know, more modular Shiny app uh, with, with fewer, fewer uh, declarative if else style things. Um, so the goal is to, to make an app where, you know, I can add any number of census variables, but you know, race, ethnicity, in income, information about, about housing and, and, and commuting, things like that. And if I structure the data appropriately, it should just be able to flow into the app and not have to do a whole lot of stuff in the back end to get it to fit in. Um, it's still very it, it, it's, it's very much in beta mode still, but I think the structure is there. Um, so um, I use a lot of stuff from the census, obviously. Um, I got a couple, another data source from a uh, researcher from the University of Florida, I believe, who did interesting work on historical estimates of housing units, of the count of housing units by census tract, all the way back to 1940. Um, so looking at the, at, at the geographies of 2010 census tracts, they went back and estimated what the count of housing units was for, for decades going back to 1940, which is an interesting um, socioeconomic and demographic analysis, I thought. Um, and then I used tidy census to pull in the census data from the API, um, that's Kyle Walker. So big shout out to him. Um, and also that pulls all the geographies. So the census tract polygons, et cetera. And then um, leaflet for mapping. Um, so next steps, you know, this is still beta. So I've got a lot of things I want to add, much more variables, topics. Uh, I want to add things like um, any information about housing costs. So like if I can find it, median rent or median mortgage payment, things like that, uh, because housing prices are um, a little loony. So figure, we can look at the data and figure out more about that. Um, and then you can also, um, you know, I'm using census tracts right now, but you know, that's arbitrary. You can change to a different geography. So you could do, you know, census blocks if you want to get even, even more granular. Um, you can go to the, the metro area or county or state, you know, it's all, it's all one hierarchy and you can drill up and down. 
with the census variables for, for the most part. Um, so my choice of track was, you know, a, just a good place to get started. But in theory, it's um, possible to make it modular where the user could select their their uh, hierarchy of geography. Um, and then I have a bunch of stuff I want to do with the UI, um, show summaries of the data, um, things like that, maybe add a floor of plus um, view. Um, so enough about that. That's the readme. Um, let's look at the app itself. So this is deployed on shinyabs.io. Um, so we have our leaflet map here. You can look into the census tracts and get the tract ID. You know, it's, it's a 12 or so digit number, um, not very informative. It doesn't say if it's North Pittsburgh or South Pittsburgh. Um, and, and, I, and I live in Pittsburgh, so I'm using Pittsburgh as a starting point. Um, but again, it's a, it's a census, so it's, it's nationwide in the US. So you can extrapolate this out to other areas easily. Um, so we have our topics here. I've got four topics um, right now. So we have median household income, the housing units, commute mode, and home ownership. Um, so the user can filter back and forth on that. Um, so let's just grab a couple and start. Um, so th th there is a bug in the palette with ggplot. I can't figure it out, but you know I have an issue for it. Um, and you'll see it here. But I'll just select three tracks. It'll populate the graph with the, you know, we hover in the, in, the, in the plot lee. It'll highlight the map up top with the tooltips. Um, and you can select the span of years. So right now I've only got it from 2010 to 2019, but you know, that's entirely arbitrary as well. You can you can change that. Um, the one note is that census tracts are redrawn every decade, or every census. Um, sometimes they don't change, sometimes they do. <clears throat> and, and, and they could be split, merged, um, entirely new ones created. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so that's another um, wrinkle in, in the app. You know, if I wanted to, if, if, if I wanted the user to, to change what they're looking at, then I would have to update which tracks are being shown in the map. Um, and that limits you to, it's, it, it's harder to compare. You know, it, if you go from 2008 to 2016, it's eight years, but there's a decade change in there. So the tracks have changed. So it's not apples to apples anymore. Right. Um, so that's another wrinkle here. Um, but I've made the, the graphs pretty modular. So if you have multiple years, it'll show a line graph. If there's a margin of error, it will show the margin of error with geo and ribbon. Um, if it's only one year, it'll switch graph types. So now it's like a TIE fighter view with the margin of errors, uh, margins of errors. Um, so you know that'll you can click and add more as you go. Right, this is always a fun outlier. Fox Chapel area in Pittsburgh. Um, so that's my, that's the way I check my data. You know, if Fox Chapel has the, the highest income in the county, then I did it right. Um, so, and you can change the, uh, the topic here. Let's go to, um, so the, the percent of population living in a house that's that has a mortgage on it, basically. If it's if it's owner occupied, um, so you know a little cluttered, but we can scale that back a little bit. Um, and you can see that these these tracks have um, decreased a little bit since 2010, right? So there's more renters as a proportion. Um, and if we go back to that one, you can see that there's a higher proportion of people living in owner occupied housing. Um, you can also um, look at the most recent year, and it'll switch back to that TIE fighter view. Um, you can also switch entirely to a different topic. It'll keep those, keep those tracks selected and just change which topic it's looking at. 
Um, so you can see that there, there's been an increase in, in housing units across the board for these. Um, but if we look at um, the Hill District in Pittsburgh, um, they, they basically demolished a whole bunch of this area and built um, an opera house and a couple of highways and the rest is parking lots. So they, they tore down a bunch of housing in a majority black um, area and, uh, and that's what the damage is. Um, so you know, there's, I think there's, there's this, this app will enable people to, to look into those historical trends. Um, what else do we have? We have um, commute mode. So let me pair this back a little bit. So if we keep this, this one and maybe go into a place where it's right in the city, we can see that the place in the suburbs has many more people that drove alone, more people that carpooled, um, but the people that live in the city a lot more of them take public transportation. Um, and I'm, I'm toying with the idea of changing these units instead of count of people to a percent of the commuters in the track so that it's more apples to apples, um, but you know, more ideas. Um, and there's a dynamic UI element here. So if there's a category in the data source, this UI element here will show up and you can get rid of that one. And then if these reach passes up by category, so you can you can add it back, you know, if you're more interested in that, if you just want to look at public transportation, you can get rid of th those two. And that UI element goes away um, if there's no category in the data source. Um, so I think, and then there's a summary table, you know, that just shows the details. Um, it's it's in DT right now. I'm I'm not sold on it. I might switch to React Table or GT, um, but I've been focusing on other parts of the app more recently. Um, are there any any questions on that part of it? It looks really nice. Uh, I think, you know, everyone was muted. I had a couple of points where I was like, ooh, and you didn't get to hear those. So I'm sorry for that. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm a, a big fan of, of this part where it switches to the yep. different chart type. Um, and I can get into that. Um, so, so just getting into the code behind the app. Um, so I've got, um, my scripts that grab the data from the data source. So for example, this grabs the census data. In, uh, so this is tidy census, this get ACS function. So for all the, all the years, 20, 2010 through 2019, I grab, um, grab the tracks and then median household income with the census variable. And then I, um, I say, um, what, what, what kind of graph is it? And, and, and what year or, or what decade are the, are the tracks for, right? So if I wanted to do 20 from 2000 to, to 2009, I would change this to say it, it's the year 2000, right? And I, I do that for all the variables I have. You know, it's mostly the same, a couple of different things. Um, Got to do a couple things with the margin of error um, to clean that up, um, but for the most part, that's all. It's all the same. Um, functions. This is the big. This is the big one. Um, so we have get data. So that's a switch function where it takes these as the input from the UI and points it to the the, the path of the file, and then just reads in that file path. So that drop down that selects the topic drives this and it points it to the file path and then reads it in. 
Um, and then we have make graph. So it takes in a, it's the data frame um, and then a custom palette. Um, and so this is how I, this is how I tell it if it's a multi-year graph or just, just a single year graph. If the count of distinct years is equal to one in single year, if it's greater than one, it's multi-year. Um, and then that's another switch function there. So that I have a, more functions down below defined that 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 make the single year graphs and the, the multiple year graphs. And that custom palette is passed down through that function. Um, and then I, so if, I, if it's just a single year, um, we have our function taking in our data frame, with the custom palette, I pull out the variable name. Um, I use that later on. I make my custom tooltip for Plotly. Um, and then this is where it gets more, more into the spaghetti code declarative style, um, but I haven't found a better way to do it. Um, but if, there, if the data source has a category and a margin of error, then it makes the error bars and uses the genome point and facets by category. If there's only a margin of error, use the error bars, no facet. If there's no margin of error or category, just make a, a, a bar chart. Um, and then same for multiple year um, input is, is a data frame custom palette, pull out the variable name. I also pull out the, the breaks um, because my years are a little different. Sometimes it's one year at a time, sometimes it's by decade. So that's a little variable. Um, but if, the, if there's a category and a margin of error, then make a ribbon chart, line, and pass it by category. If there's only a mar margin of error, no category, then make the ribbon chart with no facet. And then um, otherwise, just make a line chart. Um, and that's how that flows in. The server is, I read in um, my shape file that has the tracked geographies into a simple features table. Um, I have a modal here that, that pops up at the start and prompts the user to select a tract to get started. Um, I think Tan uh, suggested that in the Slack a while ago. Um, got my data source. So get data again, that's this switch function up here. Get data depending on the input and the, and the read that file path. And that's driven by that drop down. Um, and then we have um, this, the, the slider here. Um, if you, so here it's every one year from 2010 to 2019, right? But if the data source changes and has different, a different timeline, it'll switch to decades from 1940 to 2019, more like, like 2020. Um, and that's driven by, um, where am I? Um, that's driven by this. Basically if find the minimax, if it starts in 1940, use decades, otherwise use a single year. Um, you know, a couple different things. This is the map function, um, I want to find the, uh, where's that, make graph. So this is the code to make the graph. I have, I've got to clean up the uh, margins of error if, if, the, if it's a percent, because I want to down those between zero and one. Um, and then if else, if else, if else, and then I, take my input data frame, feed that into make graph, feed it the custom palette, and then I feed it my custom tooltip, turn off the legends. And that's that's the graph. So most of the logic is tucked away in that function script, not in the server script. Um, so this is the logic that, um, Let's the user select and remove tracks from the um, from 
the selection. Um, so you know, they can add and remove them as they want. Um, and that's a set diff thing, basically. I, I have a reactive values object here that um, so, so if the if the user clicks on a on the on the leaflet map with the group ID of base map, meaning it wasn't already selected, it adds it, it concatenates those two together and adds it and overrides that that reactive values. Um, I make the palette, I, I plot that um, plot that. If uh, if if the user clicks on a on a track that's already been selected, or sorry, that's already been highlighted by Plotly, um, then I clear that 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 highlight off the map. And then if the user user is clicking on a track that's already in that reactive values thing, I do a set diff and remove that item from the list, and that updates in in, in that reactive sense. Um, and I caught that off of a stack of overflows from like four years ago. So I didn't make that up. Very cool. <laughs> so, and then the, this, this UI is pretty simple. It has some really bad HTML up top. Um, and then just my selectized input and slider um, and that, this dynamic. UI output. So that's the that's the that's the guts of it. Um, any are there any questions on the, uh, on the on the data or the code side? Have you thought about uh, like go golemizing it? Yeah, that's my next step probably because um, I want to make that I want to add a chloroplus. Um, feature. So instead of selecting individual tracks, they'll just select a variable and a, and a year and show the show the and show the flow flows on the map. Um, and that is probably complexity enough complexity for complexity to justify <laughs> using Gollum. Um, I don't have to learn Gollum. Um, but you know that's, that's why I'm doing this to learn. So right. Does anyone else have questions? I was curious while he was talking of um, how much everyone knows about Shiny. So I threw this poll in, which a few of you have answered. Um, it looks like, uh, well, I, I apparently can't answer the polls, but uh, most of us have built at least one Shiny app, uh, at least of those of us who have replied or those who have replied. Um, and we're split on the book club. I haven't done the Mastering Shiny book book club i have it sitting on my shelf and one of these days i need to read it um but yeah <laughs> yeah it was a really great resource um you know it's, i i didn't memorize it so i i usually i don't know it off the top of my head but i know which chapter to look in at least in the book <laughs> if i get stuck yeah i've i've read pieces of it um kind of for that purpose of just like, oh, I need to figure out how to do this thing. But I really, I haven't, you know, systematically gone at it. And I think that would be helpful. Uh, that was an inter interesting one to watch being written because uh, they updated Shiny. It really seemed like in response to writing the book, Hadley was like, hey, this thing is confusing. Mm -hmm. And they changed like a pretty big thing about how modules work um, during the course of writing the book. So uh the book led to shiny being easier to use basically yeah it's, it's that book dri book driven development right? yeah yep um the, the one thing the one thing i'm that's I, i'm sort of stuck on which is a bug in my backlog is the palette is not respecting the order in which the the tracks are selected so if you watch i'll, I'll select three the second one will change after i select the third See, it's, it's 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 like light blue, and then it switches to more like a purple. So that's something I need to look into. 
and I'm trying not to do some really ugly declarative like counter update in Shiny to, to like to maintain the order in which they were selected, you know? Yeah. So that's something I've, I've got to work on. Interesting. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm just now like kind of learning a bit about Shiny. I haven't really um, built anything of my own, but like, you know how like when you start creating a Shiny app and it, I think it used the old faithful thing. I've, <laughs> I've made that, not like building it myself, but I've been able to deploy it, I guess would be the word. Um, but yeah, just kind of um, haven't read Mastering Shiny. But like there's a chapter um, in modern data science for R. Like that's the book we're using for like my advanced R and data visualization class. So that's my extent of Shiny. But yeah, I think I might join the Mastering Shiny book club. Yeah, I put it in the chat. There's a new cohort starting on Tuesday. And then if that doesn't work, just let me know and we can always launch another one. For sure. And yeah, thank you, Connor. This looks this looks really cool. I'm gonna like dig into um like look at your code more and like check it out and kind of understand a bit more. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'll uh I'll put the repo in the chat here. So so is there anything that you want help with or is this, I mean, this is your, like your playground to learn, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. And I'm, I'm trying to, um, you know, I, my local government probably is not the most like data driven um, organization on the planet. So I'm sort of making this, uh, you know, as a, as a moonshot of providing a service, you know? Um, Very cool. So, um, so yeah, if, if people have ideas, they can, you know, you can make an issue, make a PR if you have a, uh, if you have a specific variable from the census that you're interested in, in getting, um, the code structure for adding that is, you know, um, I have a script that, that grabs the data. Um, there's a certain, there's a, um, there's a structure to the data that it and that helps drive the app right so we have our margin of error column we have our, our category column and the presence or absence of those columns drives the functionality of the, of the app as i've shown um but if we do what get data and then is it housing i forget my own yeah housing i'll run that and that returns that data frame and this is the structure generally so we have our Tract ID, the, the name of the variable, the year, the estimate, the year that that, that the census tract was made in, um, and then the unit. Is it a count? Is it dollars? Is it percent? That's the general structure. And you can do um, you know, commute modes. And then here we have categories in addition to the variable, and we have a margin of error, right? And that my app will look at the at the column names in the input and make the graph custom to that. So as long as the as the census census variable can be expressed in this sort of format, then I think you can we can you know add as many as we want into the app. Uh, just just a final note. Um, if there are any, any other questions, I know Kyle Walker has a really good book he published recently on um, using his, his tidy census um, package to get census data. So um, this might be worth a book club at some point. Um, sure. You know, if people are interested, um, a lot of stuff from working with the API to doing socioeconomic like analysis, geospatial analysis, um, all sorts of mapping stuff in there. 
Um, so if people are interested in this sort of thing, um, definitely a good resource. I but do know that we have a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people who are interested in geo, uh, you know, lots of uh, geo coding. Um, so I could see that one being one that people want to do. I would definitely bring that one up in uh, book club requests and see what people think. All right. Well, I think uh, that'll probably do it. Um, looks like next month we're going to be learning about automated resumes with R from uh, Tanashi. Uh, and then January is open. So um, if anyone is is thinking about something they, they want to work on and they want to show off, um, it's uh, there's a link in the Oh, wait, I'm looking at an old version. Sorry, January is not open. February is open because Lydia took over January. Um, so uh, you got a little time, you know, if you kind of want to give a talk, but you want to uh, get some stuff sorted out, there's a, a couple of months for you to sort things out before that happens. Um, if not, uh, we can always find something to talk about. I've got lots of projects that I have running, so I could just talk about another one. Um, and yeah, we'll uh, we'll be back in a month to see someone else's project. Cool. And if you have an idea, um, signing up for for a slot is is a very good way to motivate yourself to actually do it. Absolutely. Yes. I uh, made like I... five times as many pull requests in my app <laughs> over the past two weeks than I did in the past you know two months. So yeah, I. Uh split my shiny slack app into I, I pulled or abstracted out two separate packages in order to make the presentation make more sense and one of those is on cran now so um yeah it's a fun way or it's a nice way to kind of focus yourself <laughs> into getting something done that you've been working on all right well i will see everyone uh on the slack bye all right thank you bye thank you Bye, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much.